why don't we go ahead and get started? That sounds good. So are we are we recording? Yes, it's been recording. Um, it records when we go live. So when right. you join a little later, you don't hear the recording message, but it is recording currently. Right. OK, uh, well, then I'm going to call the December 13th, 2022 meeting of the Housing and Community Development Committee to order. Uh, and it looks like we have a quorum. Um, and Anna, do you want to take the roll? OK. Are we going to be voting for the suspension of the rules? Uh, I, my my notes say quorum first. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, then we'll suspend the rules. Chair Ravel. Uh, here. Kathy Feingold. Here. Hugo Rodriguez. Present. Joanne Salome. Here. And Lauren Berlin. Here. Great. Okay. Welcome, everybody. And now, would someone like to move? Suspension of the rules to allow uh, committee members to and staff to participate remotely. So moved. And a second. Okay, so could we have a roll call on that, please? Yes, Chair Revell. Aye. Kathy Feingold. Aye. Hugo Rodriguez. Aye. Joanne Salome. Aye. Lauren Berlin. Aye. Motion passes. Great. We've suspended the rules. And then um, could I have a motion to approve the minutes of our November 15th, 2022 meeting? They were in the So, so I move to approve it. OK. And a second? Second. Thank you. OK. And a roll call. Chair Ravel. Aye. Kathy Feingold. Aye. Hugo Rodriguez. Aye. Joanne Salome. Aye. And Lauren Berlin. Aye. Great. OK, thanks, everybody. Um, so now, if there's anyone who wants to give public comment on the draft 2023 action plan, this would be the time to raise your hand. And I don't believe we have anybody. Okay. Um, I was going to suggest maybe we uh, will use this time to let anybody that wants to provide public comment, but maybe we can also have the public comment, the regular public comment, uh, while we wait for the yeah, two members I'm, I'm, of the committee. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy to go ahead and do all, all the public comment now while we wait for everybody. So, okay. so as, as at this point, it sounds like we have no one looking to provide public comment on the draft action plan, so I suggest that we close the public comment period. Okay. And then um, I believe that we can move on to regular public comment. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Sutton would like to have signed up to provide some comment. Mr. Sutton, I'm gonna um, allow you so that you can, in a meeting, so you can provide your comment. Thank you. Okay. Uh I have an opportunity to express my concern over your committee meeting tonight and some of the plans that you are going to take for action. And one that I'm opposed to is the improvements of the alleys based upon the fact that on September 19th of this year, you blocked my alley off. You blocked my entrance to both of my properties with cement pipes. And uh, as of today, we still haven't received any statement from Public Works or anybody about what is the status of our alley. It is still gravel, it is still flooding. And before you go on with these 2023 uh, programs of improvement of alleys, I think it's very important that you should either follow through on the ones that you have started or at least contact the members of the community. Half of my block is putting the garbage cans in the back the other half are still pulling them out to the front of the street. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little bit concerned that uh, in this particular community, we do not have full communications when these kinds of projects are going on. So uh, I have no reason to approve any of the things that you're gonna talk about tonight when you have not completed these projects that have already started. Thank you. Yeah, well, we're gonna have Laura Biggs Mm -hmm. minutes to talk about our alley paving program for 2023 and we'll ask her to 
to comment. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Does anybody else want to raise their hand to speak? Currently at this point, uh, there is no one else in the audience um, okay. for the public, so. Okay, great. And Council Member Reed has joined us. Um, so um, the main focus of our discussion tonight is um, talking about the 2023 entitlement grant allocations. And, I, and we have two different motions. One is to approve the allocations by goal based on the estimated 2023 CDBG home and ESG grants. And then we'll have another motion that talks specifically about um, specific uh, alloc allocations for specific programs and projects in 2023. So first, if I, staff will correct me if I miss, misspoke, but that's my understanding. Okay, so, um, so first, I guess, um, would someone like to make a motion that we recommend the 2023 entitlement grant allocations by goal based on the estimated 2023 CDBG home and ESG grants? So moved. Thank you. And a second? Second. Okay. So staff, do you want to elaborate on anything that was in the packet? Sure. Um, I think this would be a good time to take a look at the um, chart that was in the packet mm -hmm. to kind of discuss really what we presented in a, in a little bit more detail and provide an opportunity for us to discuss this. So I'm going to look to share my screen mm -hmm. and let me know that you have, you can see my screen. Yep, yep, we see okay. it. Okay, yep. thank you. Uh, and let me know if it's a little too small or if you want to see things differently. So um, the big the big topic of this ag agenda item essentially is to um, approve allocation at, by percentage for each goal mm -hmm. um, for the action plan. And part of that is the idea that if, if we're able to approve this general direction of allocation by percentage, then um, we can start we have a foundation and we can start spending money um, on projects as January 1st, which means there's continuity in some of the projects we have. And the second part of that is the reason why we have very some specific projects to approve on the second agenda item is for continuity. Mm -hmm. um, allocating uh, by goal at the percent level allows us a little bit more flexibility. So we're we're asking you to approve a general direction, but there is flexibility next year. Once we have the final grant amount, once there's maybe certain details that come up uh, or other discussion or project to kind of move things around according to the rules. Um, we're not stuck at 31% exactly. Uh, there is a little bit of leeway that uh, doesn't require a substantial amendment. Um, but we're putting forward this proposal um, as far as how to allocate the money. Um, and we'd like to discuss with you. Mm -hmm. So you have on this chart, uh, that's the same chart we reviewed last year. Um, you have the main affordable, the main goals that are uh, stated in the action plan and in our con plan. So we're following the same kind of framework that we've been talking. Um, you have affordable housing goal, the homelessness goal, livable communities, public services, economic development, and administration. Two key points to understand is administration is usually set at a very specific percentage. Um, there's a maximum we can spend and usually we come at or under that. Uh, and public services is the same. It's a very specific percentage that can be set and we cannot spend anymore. So usually that's how those two are, um, are set in at this uh, at this point in the process that leaves affordable housing homelessness and livable community goals um for both of for affordable housing um this year what we're suggesting is to allocate about 31 percent of cdbg uh we usually split half of home between affordable housing and homelessness uh with our two different program um with TBRA and then some for funding uh, affordable housing through home. Um, for CDBG, 
under how affordable housing, uh, we have two main program. We have the code enforcement program in eligible areas um, and the housing rehab program. Now, both are applications for tonight for continuity again. Um, and you may be surprised to see that the housing rehab um, number is not that high. The reason for that is because um, we have a certain amount of bandwidths that SEPA provides us. So even if we were to allocate much more money, there's only so many rehabs they can do within the year. So we try to keep that in mind as we think about how much money we're allocating. And then the second reason that was stated in the memo is we have some unexpended money from pre the couple two previous years um, because we've been playing catch up with COVID essentially. Um, so there's about $275,000 that's unexpended. This allocation is 2023 only, so it's on top of that. Um, so that's why the number may look a little smaller than uh, what you would have expected because it's just the current year allocation. Um, the second main item um, is livable communities. Under livable community, what we're suggesting is about 29% total of um, the grants and about $687, which is 36% of the CDBG um, total grant. Uh, and that numbers come from the alley paving. Now, the alley paving was fairly easy because you had already voted for the two alleys you wanted to have happen uh, earlier this um, August. So we knew that that number um, could be used here. And then there's two additional projects that are being uh, put in front of you um, tonight, um, which is the sidewalk gap and fill and sidewalk improvements, um, which is similar. It's, it's a project that we have very regularly and that you had um, approved last year as well. Um, and that was part of the packet. There is some flexibility here, uh, depending on what you're looking to do tonight. Um, but we felt like this was a good foundation to start with. We could move a little bit of money between the goals since we can move up to a MAC under on any changes under 20% of a goal doesn't require a substantial amendment. So that's a pretty decent amount of money. If we're looking at 20% of $680,000 or 20% of um, 727 in the case of affordable housing, that gives us we think enough leeway to be able to kind of make some changes if at any point um, there's something that changed. Uh, and on top of that, we're working on estimated grants. So we don't know, we may get slightly higher amounts. We've been fairly conservative this year um, following the trends that what we've seen. So there's, there's always also that low bucket that could allow us to do other things. Um, as I mentioned, the grants this year are looking, if you look at the total, they look very similar to previous years. Uh, CDBG specifically, we're looking at 1.864, but it's actually um, an estimation of an actual entitlement grant of only 1.65, so $1,650,000. What gets it to be almost on par with last year is the fact that we have program income uh, and if you remember earlier this summer, um, you had voted to approve the transfer of NSP2 program income into um, CDBG housing rehab. And so this is counting into this total now for the year. Um, so that's what kind of gets up, gets us up back to a normal or a, a level that's almost on par with last year. Had we not had that, um, it would have we would have looked a lot lower than past years. Um, you can see all the way to 2020 here, and we were almost at two million um, a few years back. So that's essentially where we're at. So you can see the percentage on the right, um, and you can see the dollar amounts that that we're suggesting um, for those goals. I, if you have any question or if you want to, yeah, I'm happy to discuss right. anything yeah. yeah does anybody and you saw that council member burns is waiting to get in yeah hugo go ahead uh, thank you um i have a couple of questions on the 20 percent flexibility um what if all the all the different funds 
have that 20%, that's a significant amount of money. And who has that, uh, that latitude to, to make uh, different allocations to what it's approved tonight or whenever this gets approved? Uh, that's question number one. And then I have a, another question in the housing rehab. You said that we have allocated the money that we didn't use on NSP onto housing rehab, but it, it looks like this year we have a smaller, uh, a lower amount of money into housing rehab per se. So um, I'm, I'm not clear on how is this happening? Where's the money coming from? Sure. Or where's is, the money put in? This is one of the trickier part to keep track of the um, in this process. Um, so as far as you're voting tonight to allocate um, allocation by goal by percentage, changes that would be made to this would be discussed with your committee. Um, so essentially, this is not changes. First of all, we would like 20% changes would be because as an example, there's a specific project. Let's say um, we are going to open the nonprofit facilities um, facilities improvement earlier in early 2023. Let's say there's application and there's a fantastic project that is the committee feels very very strongly needs to happen, but we have allocated about two hundred fifty thousand dollars for this, and maybe it's over that line but you feel that maybe there's additional, there's ways we could make it happen if we move money around or if we say, well, we're not going to do as many housing rehab because there's already this unexpected money or we have less application or anything like that. We could decide at that point to say, oh, we're, we may be able to reallocate a little bit money for a nonprofit facility, but that would have to be a discussion with this committee. So the overseeing um, of the flexibility lies within the committee then? Right. right. Okay. Okay. This isn't. Yeah. Um. And the person, the percentage, the goals, and how and what we're allocating is yes, the the committee before um, it eventually goes to city council. Um. As far as seeing a twenty percent change on all the different goals would be very very surprising. If first of all, there's a few that really can't change that much. Um. But uh, it, we would have to have complete upheaval in all of our planning for that to happen. <laughs> uh, it's very, very unlikely unless uh, suddenly major projects get canceled or something like that. Okay. Um, that I, I don't believe that has um, ever happened. And if we needed to change any goal by 20%, uh, we can do it. It just requires substantial amendments. So essentially that means we have to redraft an action plan, reopen public comment, re go through the entire process, get it approved by you, go back to the city council. It's possible. It's not advisable. It's possible because that's an admin work we spend doing that, that mm -hmm. we can't spend on working on actual program and implementation or other policy items. Mm -hmm. Um, one, question. one other question, if I may, question. Um, unless anybody else has another comment. Well, um, go, I, I don't think we've answered your second question, which was why is the housing rehab? Amount oh, thank you. Yes. Below. Yeah. So I have another question besides that. Okay. Sure. Uh, so the NSP2 program income is considered, it's called program income, but based on HUD um, regulation and uh, suggestion, we've, we've checked back with them because this isn't something that happens very frequently. Uh, they've mentioned to us that it's really gonna come in and it's gonna be treated as entitlement and not program income. So we there's $147,000 um, of NSP2 that's um, for housing rehab. Um, that is counted here and it's part if you look at the application for um the housing rehab it's part of the it's part of the budget it's in the in the little chart with the budget and it's counted as entitlement um so the, there is in this chart the chart includes entitlement and program income so that's where the housing rehab is there the other thing as well as it um, program income and RL and entitlement work 
very differently and we have to spend entitlement first, I oh. believe. So that creates a challenge. And no. Sarah is correcting oh. me. Um, here's the weird thing. Um, most of our normal program income from CDBG is actually what we call our revolving loan fund because it's repayments on our loans and it goes into a revolving loan fund that we can use only for housing rehab. Um, the NSP program income, they said we could not make revolving loan funds. We couldn't just put it into the revolving loan fund. That was kind of what we thought we might be able to do because we were saying it was for that purpose, but they said, no, you can't transfer it to make it revolving loan fund, even though it was returned loans from NSP. So don't ask me why they wouldn't let us do that, but they wouldn't. So what happens is when you have program income that isn't revolving loan, it has to be spent before you draw down entitlement. So you're treating it as if it's entitlement. The first project or activity that comes up that needs to be paid gets paid out of it. So it's just it's just a weird HUD thing. I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> okay. It just makes life really complicated. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, Joanne has a question or a comment. Now, what, well, to follow up on that. So is the NSP money in this chart? And where? <laughs> yes, it is. Okay. Uh, because it is included in the 1.864 at the bottom. This part oh. of the total CDBG, it's included in that amount. The oh. CDBG grant is only $1.65 million. Oh, okay. Oh, so okay. that's where it's included in the total, yes. Okay. And then where is the alley that Carlos talked about? What ward would that be? I believe that is Fifth Ward, and I believe it is not a CDBG funded alley. I believe that came up in a previous committee, yeah. and um, Councilmember Burns might be able to correct me. I'm yeah. um I believe it's funded through a different source with, is this maybe the oh. water, so the, the waste treatment trans plan? Waste transfer station money? It's the waste yes. transfer station. Oh. Yeah. I, I just hopped on, I didn't hear his question, but I, I think I've said this before, uh, the alley is fully funded and um, and, and if, if, has it all, if it has it already, it should start construction soon, but that is, it oh. is fully okay. funded. And I've communicated that to, uh, Carlos and I know he's on the call. He can he can reach out to me directly, and I'll give him as much inform additional information as he needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, it it sounds like it's been taking a long time to get work done. But, yeah. yeah, there was a there was an easement issue that has been addressed. So so again, if if the question was mm -hmm. just when are they going to start construction, I can get him an exact um, or a, a you know a, a, a timeline directly from uh, staff and the contractor. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It was a, a comment problem, as I recall. But anyway, yeah, Ugo, you have another question? I do. And I my question is brief, but the response, I don't know how brief it'll be. But <laughs> it is the lack of any funds allocated to the economic development. And I see that historically we have, it's like a little small bucket or a cup not quite a bucket of funds that go into that. And I, I wonder why, if maybe we can get a little bit of education on that, that's it. Sure. Um, so the reason we didn't allocate money to economic development this year is because we still have funds um, that have not been spent yet uh, from a previous year. Um, and part of the reason why it's not spent necessarily is because there are a lot of restrictions that come with CDBG funding um, especially for economic development. Um, so a lot of the time, some of the projects that uh, come up for economic development are not necessarily eligible. Um, and there's more flexible source of funding that are usually available for those projects um, that are preferred. Um, so we didn't wanna keep allocating money until we um, have actually used up the money that's from previous year. Is there any way then that we know what's the amount that's there sure. floating Seven, on use? Um, so we yeah, kind of 70. know that those are available for yeah. eligible uh, programs or projects. Uh, there's about $75,000 that's um, allocated, I believe, from 
previous year. We also, um, part of this is, um, we also had um, quite a bit of CDBGCB that was um, put forth for economic development uh, in previous years as well, uh, which is also why it's delayed the use of CDBG in previous years. Um, so there's that as well. We okay. do work um, closely with the economic development staff and keep them apprised of available funds too. So a lot of it, as Marianne said, is, for example, um, even though in some areas we may be able to use um, um, CDBG for facade improvement, then you run into the problem of having them use pay Davis Bacon prevailing wages and that kills it on that. So there are certain, again, cases where it just doesn't work. <laughs> and I just, I, I don't, uh, Chair Riva, I don't know if, um, Larry Biggs has raised her hand and I think she may have some comment about the alley. So um, whenever in the conversation that works, um, just want to let you know. Okay. Um, and is there a way to promote Laura as a panelist? Oh yeah, there is. I just I just don't want to sidetrack the conversation if we're still in the middle. Oh, okay. So, because uh, we could go ahead and, and wrap up this discussion, vote on the allocation by goal which is what we've been talking about, and then go on to the next motion, which is looking specifically at the various uh, projects and programs being that we're gonna be allocating money to. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, okay, so why don't, so we've had that motion um, that we recommend the 2023 entitlement grant allocations by goal based on the estimated 2023 CDBG home and ESG grants. Um, and so could we have a, Roll call on that motion, please. Yes, Chair Ravel. Aye. Councilmember Reed. Aye. Councilmember Burns. Aye. Kathy Feingold. Aye. Hugo Rodriguez. Aye. Joanne Salome. Aye. Lauren Berlin. Aye. Motion passes. Great. Okay. Thanks, everybody. So now, um, just to get us started on the next part of the discussion. Um, could I have a motion to approve the 2023 CDBG funding for City of Evanston programs and projects based mm -hmm. on estimated 2023 CDBG grant amount that was listed in our packet? So moved. Okay, and a second. Second. Okay. So um, I know so we have Laura to talk about some of these projects. Do we, should we get? Um, or do we have, yeah. We we do have uh, Rob Anthony from SEPA that was gonna start around uh, to oh, discuss uh, the housing rehab housing application. Rehab. But okay. I believe, um, Lara, I believe that you maybe had some, if you have some feedback you wanna provide around the alley that uh, Mr. Sutton was talking about, feel, please feel free to do so. I, I can, or I can wait until we talk about alleys in general. That would be fine as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let, let's, we'll, we'll save all the alley. <laughs> discussion for uh, in a few minutes. Um, so we have Rob Anthony from SEPA um, to talk about the housing rehab program that and the idea is that we would be allocating $434,550 towards um, the housing rehab at this point. So Rob, welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I um... I don't have a lot to add other than what's in the application. Um, as Marion mentioned, the owner occupied rehab program has been pretty slow the past two years. Uh, in 2021, it was really because of um, COVID and, and catching up with COVID because at that time we weren't sending people into occupied homes to do rehabs, particularly because um, a lot of the clients, um, the residents through the program are seniors and, and people with disabilities or other health issues. Um, so then in this year, we started getting back into our regular routine of doing more. Um, and then the city had asked us to manage the rehabs for the reparations program. And so we did 12 uh, reparations pr rehab projects this year, which really took up a lot of our time, and frankly, um, we we couldn't do as many of the the CDBG funded owner occupied rehab. Um, 
but we um those are done for the most part i think nine of the 12 are done the other three are wrapping up very soon so um, i think we're we're caught up and on track to be able to do uh, at least nine homes next year um, in addition to the funds that the city allocates there is um, there's funding available through the illinois housing development authority uh, for us to do some home accessibility projects and also to do some other home repair and roof only projects as well uh, the roof only projects is a new funding program for us next year um, so one of the challenges now with using federal dollars is sometimes people just need one thing they want a furnace or they want a roof but if we put a dollar of federal funding into a house um, we need to make sure it meets uh, housing quality standards it brings things up to code so um, you know a lot of times people um, don't want a full rehab of their home and so this will allow us to do just a, a roof only if that's what they're looking for so we're we're excited about that um the ida funded program is forgivable so those dollars are forgiven 1 60th every month so over a five-year period they're completely forgiven uh, whereas the city's funded program is uh, there's no monthly payment, but it is repayable um, at the time of sale. It just sort of sits out there until there's a transfer mm -hmm. of the property. Um, and I think that's all I really had, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. So committee, um, yeah, Council Member Burns. Rob, before you went into the uh, the the kind of deferred, uh, the repayable deferred loan. What what was the other thing you described? I missed it. The the roof only option. Can you explain uh, that one more time? Sorry. Yeah, so um, under this new IDA program, we can do a roof only. So uh, with other federally funded rehab programs, if someone needs a roof but we go in and we find lead or we find mold or there's radon or other things that we have to take care of we need to add that to the scope of the rehab project and uh, with a roof only project we can limit the scope to only doing the roof and not having to do a larger rehab project if the homeowner doesn't want to and you said that one is forgivable i'm trying to I'm trying yeah. to uh, understand which one you said was forgivable. Right. So all of the IDA funded work is forgivable. And in the packet, it talks about, you know, uh, um, having a future discussion about um, about a forgivable loan program. Uh, in addition, uh, I guess, in addition, the way it's being proposed now, in addition to the uh, repayable uh, deferred loan, um, I guess this is a question for staff. Is Is that and it, it basically said, Rob, that you would hear back from Ida at the end of December. Have you already heard back? And this is what the program, this is what uh, what you heard back that you can use this money for, for roof work, for roof repair, or is that um, another? So it, it's brand? a combination. We have some money um, already allocated from Ida that we can use next year. There's another grant that we're waiting to hear from Ida on this month, which would be additional funding that would be available likely around March or April of next year. But that would likely extend beyond just roof repair work, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. And yep. then and going back to the roof repairs, the money we have now from Ida, is that is that only if um, uh, one of those, you know, you mentioned right down in something to lead or something else, is that only if that's found in the roof? Or I'm just trying to understand how that connects with the roof. Or is that no, so we're under our current program, we're required, regardless of what kind of work is being done, we're required to do a bold inspection, lead based paint inspection, radon is inspection. So, um, you know, even if someone wants, um, you know, siding done on the outside of their home and that's all that they need, we're required to do it a lead inspection inside and radon inside and look at the whole house. Whereas with the roof only option, we won't have to do that. We can do a, a targeted, just go in and do the roof and, and not have to do anything else. Okay, I see. And then 
I, I guess based on the um, how many uh, uh, when people apply for this program, are they going? Uh, do they ever go directly to uh, Rob to SEPA when they apply for the forgivable or for the uh, I guess for both of these programs? Or are they going through staff first and then city staff and then they're referred to SEPA? Yeah, that's it's a really good question. We when we started working with the city to help administer the program, we didn't want there to be confusion and multiple wait lists. And so um, we said that people should continue to apply through the city the city sort of manages that list and sends projects to us. Um, the, the one exception to that is that um, we, and I didn't even talk with Sarah about this yet, but we do have home accessibility program dollars that need to be expended by uh, July of next year. And we, in, in, in order to get those projects closed by July, we really need to start them no later than about February. And so we are doing some marketing right now just around the home accessibility program, just to get the word out as much as possible in Lake County and in Evanston um, so that we get those applications <laughs> in to make sure we use all those dollars before the grant expires. But yeah, typically it goes to the city. Yeah, and much of that is targeting um, seniors too. So, you know, yeah. it's... Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, the home accessibility sense. program has to be seniors or persons with disabilities. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And Rob, we can regroup to see um, how I can help with the outreach if there's anything we can do on our side. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then since we're on this point, then I have two more quick questions. What are, what are some of those improvements, home accessibility improvements? Yeah, so we can do um, lifts, ramps, accessible doorways, accessible kitchens, accessible baths, um, and we can actually do other work too uh, that's not accessibility related as long as at least 50% of the work is accessibility related. So um, in other words, we can spend uh, you know $10,000 on an accessible kitchen, but then also do another $10,000 of electrical work or plumbing work or other rehab needs that the homeowner or the tenant has, as long as half of it is accessibility related. Oh, great. And, and, then, and then the, how long, two more quick questions. And then the wait list, uh, this is for city staff. How, um, do we have a wait list currently for any of these programs? We do. And I apologize, but I do not have the information on the number of people on it. Do you happen to have that, Marion? I did not get that. I don't have that, but we also have to keep in mind that uh, some of the uh, situation and restriction makes a difference in how many people we have on the list because they may be on the list, but they may not totally be eligible or not interested anymore. So, right. um, I, but we can probably get that information um, for the committee. And who is but, the kind of manager of the list, the wait list? Um, Chris Van Ord on our, on our team. Okay. And then um, Chris works with um, Alicia at um, uh, SIPA, and, and they actually kind of parse out which projects get going and, and um, also handle the sort of like what Rob was talking about, like, uh oh, we got to get the um, accessibility money used first. So that ends up sometimes leading to priorities, um, you know, just based on you know, what you have to spend so you don't lose it. <laughs> you prioritize those projects so it doesn't get returned to Ida because we haven't spent it within a specific time. Yeah, so the last thing I'll say is that I, I think it's important for us to, uh, for this committee to follow uh, the discussion closely at, that we're having at the reparations committee because I think there's some overlap. Um, we, we're also having kind of capacity challenges in um, um, awarding the reparations benefits, in particular the ones uh, uh, where home improvement is 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 uh, is selected um, for the same reasons I think um, you know Rob and, and Sarah I think it was Sarah talked about earlier and so we are working on different solutions some of which would involve uh, you know hiring out um, contracting with another organization potentially and again none of this has been approved some of it has been discussed so I'm not saying that any of this will happen I'm just saying what is a part of what's been a part of the discussion. Uh, but um, uh, potentially maybe even hiring a staff person as well as some other uh, uh, solutions that we're coming up with. And um, 
again, I think there's a lot of overlap with that in this, because if there are, if we have the, the funding, and this is the same way I feel about reparations, we should be trying to, um, we need to find a way to build the capacity to, to, mm -hmm. to, to issue the funding, to get the project management started, to get the improvements going. And again, this is not a, a, a current staff issue. It's just how do we build that capacity to do more work? Uh, that's all, Chair. Thank you. Okay. One of the interesting things that we discussed, at least Rob and I discussed, but then we figured it doesn't really work, is some of the reparations, one of the things that you can do with CDBG is we can pay the administrative costs out of CDBG and then have a different funding source for the actual um, work. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. challenge we have there is we did not recommend that because to do that with reparations, we would have to income qualify the people for that CDBG. And that just did not fit with the program of qualifying. I mean, it just, it's just not, that is, you know, we have to, mm -hmm. we could only use CDBG for households with incomes under 80% of the year and median. And, and that I think would be a huge problem with the reparations. Uh, uh, so we we looked at that, but we couldn't literally do it. <laughs> yeah, way. I think there's a way to build capacity with, uh, with, with uh, not with CDBG G dollars, but other dollars that could go towards building more capacity, not only for reparations, but also for these programs. But but again, we can talk about that, uh, yep. and, um, you know, yep. offline in future discussions. I just wanted to flag it because I think it's yes. overlap. Yes, that's important. And All also right, just wanted to remind everybody that once Rob hears about the, you know, I, it'll probably be in January, I hope that we'll hear about the amount of, of whether you get this additional, because oh. we did say we wanted to pilot moving our CDBG grants, I mean, work um, to forgivable loans um, on the same 10 year burn off that um, the SEPA larger ones, uh, you know, they have $40,000 ones uh, funded through IDA because we've talked about the importance of um, leaving equi more equity for our lower income families to pass on. So that's, but we, <laughs> IDA doesn't always respond on their grant awards as quickly as we would like them to. We'd hope we would be able to do that at this meeting, but we'll have to do it, you know, next meeting. Okay, Ugo, you've been waiting patiently. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I forget that I don't want my dog to be barking at all of you <laughs> at the same time as it barks to me. Um, a couple of questions. One, the first one is a clarification, uh, Rob. I the roof only is it really only roofs or are there any other uh, um, improvements or repairs that can be made to a home under that category of roof only meaning no other implications other than a particular work uh, or maybe it is actually just roof only yeah it's it's literally a category of ida's rehab that's restricted to only doing roofs it could be um, you know, shingles and the um, decking if you need to replace decking, but it has to be specifically related to the roof only. Okay. And my question yeah. then, thank you for that clarification. I just wasn't quite clear in my mind about it. Um, I know that Ida and many of their programs, they do across the board an allocation of funds and whoever comes in and use them uses the funds and that's, that's the end of those funds. Um, for this case of um, both the accessibility, the roof only and, and other funds that we're talking here, are those allocated to the city of Evanston specifically or we're fighting with everybody who, uh, who it's eligible to these funds uh, to use them? Um, it's not specifically to Evanston, it's a grant to SEPA that SEPA can use in Lake County or Evanston. And so um, the total grant uh, we expect to be around four hundred and thirty or four hundred and forty thousand dollars for two for two years. And so what we estimated um, in this budget was the amount that we anticipated to spend in Evanston next year between okay. our current grant and the new grants. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, um, council member, oh, Sarah. You have... I just wanted to raise one other quick question with Rob because this just occurred to me. We have this solar grant to put solar on um, for lower income um, residents. And one of the things that I know is that <clears throat> new roofs are a good thing and a good sign of ability to handle solar. So it occurred to me that as we get that worked out and Kara is trying to work it out because all of these earmark grants then get assigned to um, <clears throat> whatever federal agency is closest to what would normally deal with that. So it's um, the EPA, I think that Kara is working with on that, but it would be interesting if we would have the opportunity to look at possibly as we get into this eligibility for giving them solar as well. And that might require an electrical upgrade. And mm -hmm. I guess the question is, is there any way we could swing that? Or maybe that's just something to put an idea out there and we can work work on it later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense to coordinate that. I, I think that if we had to do an electrical upgrade, it would probably fall into the IDA owner-occupied rehab category as opposed to the roof-only category. Um, but it would make a lot of sense to try to coordinate that. And, and um, yeah, if you're doing a new roof, then let's try to get some solar on it too. And we should check to see if that electrical upgrade comes as part of the solar package, because that would be great. I yeah. mean, I just, I just, it's like, how can we, we're always trying to fit things together. So that's what I. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That would be great. It would be great. Yeah. Uh, Council member Reed, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, one, I just wanted to say thank you, Ugo, for the question about the roof only, because I was actually also under the same impression that there was just kind of a catch-all term of art for smaller projects so thanks for that clarification uh but i, I wanted to ask uh, uh mr anthony about uh are, when, when you all uh you know are doing the roof only projects or other pro are, are, are folks being you know given you know materials or an education about the the harms of lead and radon or folks informed about what they're for, foregoing and and then you know on top of that why might someone forego that kind of testing? And, and is there not funding avail available to remediate those issues? Yeah, yeah, great questions. Um, so yes, absolutely, people are informed. They get the lead flyers, they get the radon flyers. We talk to them about what those risks are. So um, that's definitely communicated. Um, in terms of why someone might not want to do that, the reasons um very um oftentimes what we see is so with a deferred program like the city of Evanston has um there they have a lien put on their house for the amount of the loan and so someone might come in and say i only want a furnace that's going to cost me four thousand dollars to replace and only have a four thousand dollar lien on my house um, I don't want to do all this other work that's going to, yeah, you're still going to pay for it. You're going to do $40,000 of rehab on my home, but now there's going to be a $40,000 lien on my home if it's not forgiven. Even under the forgivable program, um, some people do not want those liens on their house. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I completely understand when they're not forgivable. Um, in most cases, if they're forgivable, I think it makes a whole lot of sense to go ahead and, and, and get those improvements done, uh, particularly if it's a five-year forgivable period that's prorated every month, uh, because typically the um, increase in value, resale value of your home is going to more than compensate for any outstanding lien that you have to pay back. But that that's a, a big reason. People are concerned about the liens. Um, other times people just don't want to deal with the impact of having someone come in and have to remediate all of the lead and the dust and the work that's involved and the time and it's intrusive and uh, they just don't want to have to uh, extend their project that long and, and be that intrusive. Um, other times people have, um, uh, you know, they have other things they want to get done that are bumping up against the limit of the rehab project. And so um, they they don't um, have money available um, that they want to spend on lead and radon because they're trying to upgrade 
their electrical or their plumbing or deal with a um, you know a flooding issue in their basement or something like that, um, and that's a higher priority for them. Okay. Thank you. And I just want to uh, just flag one 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 more thing. Uh, and if you have a response for it, fine. Or if if it's just a flag, that's also fine. But I, I'm I'm curious about how you all are uh, training your staff on the ground, or what you all are doing to make sure that you know. Because I can imagine very well intentioned people you know, either one just kind of handing over the form as the, the information about the, you know, lead radon and all that, all of that, handing it over just as a formality um, mm -hmm. and not really going into detail about it. Or again, well-intentioned people saying, hey, um, if you want to avoid having to go through all of the trouble of doing the lead and testing and, you know, it's essentially saying exactly what you just said, uh, but, you know, just saying, hey, you can go for this roof only project or we can try to use these other funds. Um, yeah, I just want to, you know, make sure that, you know, because I, I would think that. And then also on our end, I, I guess staff, we should examine how we can make this program more inviting to folks, because uh, I just think there's no reason that someone should. Give up the opportunity to, to have those harmful compounds remediated and removed from their house so yeah I, and then also agreed. if you guys keep track of metrics i'd love to you know see you know who's refusing it and maybe uh, why are they refusing it so just we can get that feedback and use that uh, you know to craft something better absolutely okay. and if, if any of you have met our home inspector uh aiden who uh handles the evanson projects he for better or worse, loves to talk. And so he will go into great depth about <laughs> radon and mold and lead and all the the ways that it's bad for you. And he he loves to talk with people about that stuff. So okay. Um Ugo, another question? Another question. Sorry about that. Um what was my question? Oh, when uh, say somebody goes through the process and wants to do the abatement of lead or, or radon in their properties, radon is a lot easier than to, to deal with than with uh, asbestos or lead in the piping and, and other places that could be also lead presence in the house. Uh, do they Are they offered housing in the meantime? Because it could be incredibly intrusive and costly, and I totally understand what you were saying, uh, Rob, in regards to probably the funds that they were thinking of are going to be depleted just by the abatement mm -hmm. uh, project, and then they have nothing left for their flooding basement. So yeah. I, I totally understand that. But my, my question is in regards to are there uh, temporary housing uh, part of the part of the uh, formula for this? Yeah, temporary relocation is an eligible expense. Uh, fortunately, we don't have to do it very often. Um, usually we can, um, you know, segregate part of the house and people can stay in that house. And there's the, you know, plastic shields that come down and get taped to the floor and all that type of thing. Um, but, but we have had to temporarily relocate people uh, for some projects, but most of the time we, we don't need to. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Lauren, you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, following up on Council Member Reed's question, I'm just thinking about why someone would turn this down. And I'm wondering if you have any sense of whether trust sort of is a factor. And if so, and, and this may be presumptuous on my part, in which case I completely apologize in advance. But if you think trust is a factor, I'd be curious to know, um, you don't have to answer now, but like, if the demographics of the people of the staff interfacing with eligible homeowners match the demographics of the homeowners, and if not, if that's something we could consider, just because there's a lot of research, I think, especially if you're talking about a population that's been historically disenfranchised or discriminated against, um, I can see not wanting a lien on your property if you have no mm -hmm. reason to get lifted. So um, that's just something I, I would be curious to like think a little bit more about if we have the right people communicating um these messages to eligible homeowners yeah i think i think that's a great point 
Thanks. Okay. Well, Rob, thank you so much for all this good information. Um, I thank think, you. Yeah. Um, one one note on on especially with seniors, um, we haven't done this recently because we haven't been taking on a whole lot of new, uh, you know. But one of the things we've done successfully in the past, and and we'll do if we run into some of those problems, is we go to our um, senior services. Um, staff um, and see if any of them already have a relationship with people. Um, um, Audrey <laughs> Thompson mm -hmm. can't do everything, but you know she has been critical to um, working with our residents for reparations and and sometimes just Audrey or one of her staff can can help bridge some of that as well. And, and we do use that and and we'll go back to that. And, and uh, Nancy Flowers before Audrey, um, we try to use the relationships that other staff may have built up with people to to mm -hmm. help in those cases. Great. Yeah, and maybe 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 something like this already exists, but if not, I don't know if there's an opportunity because obviously there's technical expertise that I'm sure Rob, your staff has taken a lot of time to develop, right? And so no disrespect to them at all. And maybe there's some community ambassadors or something like that, if you all haven't already done that, or people who've gone through the, the program and gone at this extra step of radon mm -hmm. remediation or whatever, you know, in our few years in could sort of testify to the benefits and that it's trustworthy and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Okay, well, let's shift gears and uh, turn to Laura to talk about um, alley improvements and sidewalks and those kinds of things. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, I believe Angel is first because oh. she also only has one oh. item and uh, oh. Laura's team is four. Okay. okay, all right. Angel. I'm really sorry, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, code enforcement. Hello. Uh, so you guys want a little history here, huh? So we um, we are looking to increase our CDBG funding for 2023 um, because uh, first of all, we added a staff member last year. So we're going to have additional expenses um, moving forward with the new staff member and um, all that they would bring to the team and the inspections, um, but also, the fact that as we continue to discuss rental licensing versus rental registration um, and we move towards making improvements in our software, that funding is going to be important to um, keep property standards and code enforcement um, moving forward to be able to meet the needs as we move those programs, um, hopefully into fruition. So um, we are asking for an increase in the funding this year to help facilitate um, some of those um, additional um, aspects of, of our, our jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Questions or comments from the committee? And so Angel, the, the funding is, is really is, uh, helping pay for the new, the, the additional inspector or the, the additional funding. Yes. Would help to, um, cover some of the expenses of the additional inspector, um, in terms of their salary and everything that that entails with, you know, uh, mm -hmm. some funding for equipment or, or the offset for some of the vehicle services that they use. Um, and then also to look um, to take some of that money and be able to use it to look to the improvements that we're going to need for our software as we um, right. look to just, expand our programming. Just yeah. a note on how that is done. This is the allocable the allocation method allowed by HUD okay. is um, our when our inspectors are working on cases, uh, either doing inspections or doing paperwork for cases that are within our CDBG target area. Um, all of that work, mm -hmm. they keep, they do time and activity tracking as required mm -hmm. that then allows us to allocate that proportion of their salary and benefits to our CDBG budget. Mm -hmm. And we also then can allocate a portion of other program costs, like a database cost, you could split mm -hmm. on that same basis. So um, that's, the, that's the most common method of um, cost allocation that is allowed by the federal government for a program like this. Mm -hmm. And what it does is 
um, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, we have a lot of rental in our target area, and it is for our lower income residents that it's very important to have routine inspections, and we really want to, but it's, again, our goal is to move to a inspection schedule based on what happened in that inspection. So it doesn't mean we're still, we still want to make our inspections, how the frequency of inspections um, tied to the outcome of the inspection. So it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be inspecting more frequently um, in the CDBG target area. At one point, our, our only way of doing it was we had a, uh, with HUD, we said that our experience that we had greater number of code violations and things like that in the CDBG target area and had an automatic um, schedule that was more frequent in the CDBG target area. And that is not what we, that's part of the whole rental um, monitoring, you know, the whole property maintenance program that we're moving toward. So I just wanted to make it clear that it isn't to, it's not like we're just adding an inspector only in the CDBG target area. It gives us more bandwidth for all inspections. Right, right. which yeah. is important. Right, yeah, okay. Ugo, go ahead. Um, Kathy had her hand raised and I, I talk a lot. So uh, I, if Kathy still has her question, I'll defer no, to you and then I, I'll ask actually, my question if I, appropriate. Sarah kind of spoke to what I was gonna ask. So that's why I okay. took my hand down, but thank you. Sure, my pleasure. So I still have my question. And my question is, could we get uh, a little bit more uh, distribution of this $400,000, if you will. So if if our committee is, is in charge of overseeing this and approving this fund, so we have something a little bit more concrete of what you're talking already, which is uh, partly is for the, for the hiring of a new inspector, uh, the rental database, and all of the other things that Sarah just mentioned also that it'll be a lot more usable, but can we have some distribution of these $400,000? Because if we only say to hire an inspector, it sounds like we're hiring a CEO inspector, mm -hmm. and that'll be quite a, quite a salary. So uh, I think that it'd be best to understand this for, for our committee and for posterity history of the committee's uh, approvals to have a better breakdown. So that is my question. And, and but I have a, a, a now um, talking about it, I have another question. And it is that this inspectors are going to work because, you, you know, kind of because of the lack of economic resources, a lot of the uh, violations, code violations or whatever, uh, unsafe conditions and all of that are found in areas where less economic wealth. So, but these inspectors are, are acting across the entire city because there are rentals at all levels in the city of Evanston and there are unsafe and many times unsanitary conditions at all, at all levels also. So I, I just wanted to make sure that everybody's treated equally when the inspectors are out and about and not just the areas that have less resources to do. And if that were the case, are we allocating funds to help these folks that we find in violation? And it is due to their condition, their economical conditions to not being able to address the issues that make these violations appear. So um, I think I can, get your questions there. So this $400,000 is not for one inspector. Um, the 325 or whatever uh, that we've previously asked for has covered um, four inspectors and the supervisor, and now we've added an additional inspector. Mm -hmm. So we increased our funding to do that. So it's not just for one person, it's to help cover all of it. But all of our inspectors do inspections all over Evanston. It's not just in the CDBG area. Um, we do inspections in any rental property anywhere in Evanston. Um, the issue that we have predominantly in CDBG is that as we do the inspections in these areas, you're correct, they have less funding to do the repairs. And so sometimes it takes more time for us to spend in that area because we need to work with them longer 
to bring them into compliance. But additionally, we also respond to complaints and we historically get more complaints in a CDBG area because the landlord isn't fixing the issue and so the tenant calls to complain. So the inspectors spend a lot of time in the CDBG areas doing those inspections. But you're right, we do inspections in any area. Okay. Um, also, um, the people with code vari uh, violations are referred to the housing rehab program. Correct. Some of them don't take it. Um, some of them do. We actually, it wasn't through code inspection violations. We are actually right now working on a two flat that was the um, property owner just said, hey, I can actually, I would really like to rehab and take care of some issues that I, I would like to improve in my property. So that's a positive thing. Um, and one of the things I think that we run, have run into is um, uh, we get the same resistance from property owners because uh, uh, they're mostly small property, you know, relatively small landlords. Um, as we have gotten from homeowners, they are reluctant to have a lien on their property and to need to pay back a loan. So um, I think that that would, um, having forgivable loans um, would be helpful for the, that as well, so. Um, and to add to that, Ugo, um, I just wanna make sure you were able to see, um, it's not exactly the answer to your question, but in the application, there was a budget at the last page that kind of shows the whole budget with the spread of the different expenses. Um, so you can, it covers the whole budget, not just the $400,000, but you can at least see the scale of what's for salaries, what's for others costs, what's for the database, et cetera. Thank I was you, seeing yes. unicorns towards the end of the report. So it was pretty long. So I probably missed that. Sorry about that. that that's okay. I just wanted to make sure that you could refer to it if you wanted to take a deeper look. Yeah, that's great. Any more questions or comments for Angel? Okay, well, thank you very much, Angel. Thank you so much for your time. Yep, okay. Now, finally, Laura and the alleys. <laughs> right, and we have uh, four different projects, I believe, for application right. for um, from Lara and her team. So yes. Lara, if, you're, if you'd like to go ahead. Um, sure. So it's a pretty typical every year that we apply for at least one alley for improvement. This year, at the request of Council Member Reed, we applied for two. Um, the first alley um, is in the eighth ward. The second alley, uh, and it was sort of next on our list, and the second alley is the alley that is adjacent to the um, living room that's being developed at the house. Uh, that is owned by St. Francis. So Council Member Reed asked us to make sure that was improved. So we are also requesting funding for that alley. And uh, just as context, I believe the committee is aware that you uh, we did a prioritization of alleys. Uh, we're working through 2024, um, but those two alleys, you uh, the committee has already voted as part priority for 2023. So right now we're discussing the funding, but there, there was already some, some initial decision from this committee, which is why we put both forward as well in this um, allocation plan. Right, right. So any any questions about the alley? Oh, yeah, we'll go, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> again, um, I just wonder if, uh, if maybe Lara has uh, some response to Carlos or ah. are, is he going to go on the side to talk to uh, council member Burns uh, outside of this meeting. I, I do. And um, the, so the alley that is, that is his alley is being improved using waste transfer station funds that were settlement for um, the waste transfer station, the city and the station got into a suit about a lawsuit about what fees were being charged. And this was part of the settlement. And we've been using it to improve infrastructure, primarily alleys around the waste transfer station area. Um, I believe his is the last alley actually that is being approved. And part of the reason is because that alley required an easement from ComEd 
uh, who owns property along there. We received that easement and we started construction and there turned out there was some underground infrastructure that ComEd had shown, had not shown us, which is their infrastructure. We, when we approve an alley, we um, add a sewer system for drainage and put in a concrete slab. Um, in this case, ComEd is requiring us to use asphalt so that they can reach their infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But we had to shift the sewer um, over and to avoid their duck pig. And when we did that, it got so close to the poles that are running along the alley that they are requiring, it required them to design a shoring system for the poles. And so that's put a big delay on the project. Um, the communication has not been adequate. And for that, I do apologize. And we'll get a newsletter out to the residents promptly. Um, to make sure that everybody understands what's happening. Unfortunately, because um, materials, everything shuts down for the winter in road construction, the materials to improve the alley are not going to be available until spring. So yeah. I will also work with staff to make sure that we leave the alley in a usable condition and everybody understands where to put their garbage cans and everything else. My apologies to Mr. Sutton. Yeah. And I just want to clarification. I think just a portion of the alley is going to be asphalt, um, unless that's changed. I think that uh, that could be. I'm not 100 okay. percent on that. So you yeah, portion their portion they wanted it to to be asphalt, and the city's side is going to be uh, concrete. Mm -hmm. Right. Complicated project. Um, it's been a very challenging construction season in general. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a strike that made it so that we could not get asphalt from June through August. And as soon as we could, uh, the worldwide cement shortage that hadn't been a problem in the Chicago area because we couldn't do most of the road construction projects in the metropolitan Chicago uh, metropolitan area, all of a sudden cement uh, concrete became a problem and we've struggled to get any concrete this, this fall. So it, it's really, it's like you, I almost feel like you can't even make this stuff up. There's so many excuses this year, but there have been some pretty tremendous supply chain issues. Yeah, right. And just just following the comments, uh, Carlos mm -hmm. is a is a, a regular um, commenter mm -hmm. at many of our meetings. He serves on the reparations uh, committee alongside myself, Councilmember Reed, and others, and also have his direct email and phone number. So I will communicate to him the delays. I was not made aware of. Uh, um, of the delays, which which happens, um, it's a, it's a busy time, uh, but I'll, I'll I'll make sure he gets the information. Um, I, I hopped on a little late. Typically, his concerns have, have been based around whether or not the alley is even funded, and so uh, you know my earlier comments were just reassuring this group, which I think I've communicated that before that it is a fully funded uh, out of a different fund and. Um, and today I realized that there are some delays, which which will make sure to communicate that to fix more residents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other alley related comments or questions? Or, or Laura, you've got a couple sidewalks to talk to us about. I do. Um, so historically we have replaced, we have sidewalk squares using a 50-50 cost share with residents. Um, from the adjacent property owner. After a discussion with council about how that is not really equitable and really doesn't speak to our CARP goals of trying to make safe, complete pedestrian pathways, we have switched to a, a fully city funded sidewalk improvement program. However, we have over a decade of backlog of sidewalk to be repaired. And we have a plan for doing it. Um, we're addressing higher priority areas first near schools and um, senior facilities and then on to medical near medical facilities and so on. However, in areas like CDBG, or we also are using TIF funds in some areas, we are trying to get a jump start on sidewalk replacement. And so we have two projects. One is for just replacing deteriorated sidewalk squares in the in the CDBG areas. And the other is a program that we haven't been doing at all, which is to infill gaps where sidewalks um, were not installed in order to 
make a complete um, pedestrian network. Mm -hmm. So um, we have so that particular gap infill is on Leland Avenue from Emerson Street to Wade Street. Leland is just east of Beck Park along the canal mm -hmm. in the Fifth Ward, and there is. Um, no sidewalk there. And so this is a major pathway to get to one of the main entrances of Beck Park. Mm -hmm. And so, oh, thank you. Um, so for that reason, we are um, proposing to put sidewalk in that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a big project. Um, yeah, so of all, all of these projects are kind of the two alleys and the sidewalk gap. I would say um, either fund them or don't fund in them, but don't leave us with a partially funded project. However, sidewalk improvements, um, it's simpler. Like if there were $20,000 of funding available, we are happy to take 20,000. If it's 100,000, we're happy to take 100,000. Um, that's pretty flexible because we just <laughs> um, contract or expand the program to fit the funding. Since each square of sidewalk costs about $250 to replace. Yeah, right, wow. Yeah, Ugo, go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Um, gap infill, I noticed that it happens kind of erratically around the city. And in some instances is very close to schools which, you know, when I'm walking my dog, I have to get on the street because there is no sidewalk or cross the street midway because the sidewalk stopped at one point. Also, I've noticed that. So maybe if you could give us a little bit of a historic background of why that happened, that some streets don't have sidewalks. And also, I, I presume, and I'm, perhaps wrong at doing that, that that land still belongs to the city, even if it's taken over by the owner of that property that is adjacent to that parkway uh, that is not there because there is no sidewalk, there is no parkway. It's it's a front yard to somebody, which I totally understand, but somebody, some, some homeowners become very possessive of that land that is really not theirs and they obstruct even the passage on the muddy si uh, grass or whatever the non-existent sidewalk so i was just wondering why historically how that happened how is it that some areas don't have sidewalks in the city i you know that's a really good question i don't have a complete answer to that there are a mix of reasons. In some cases where I've investigated it in specific locations, a lot of the areas of the city were like a farm was dedicated to the city and plats of subdivision were de you know, developed and all the properties were marked out. And a developer at that time might own several properties and, and make an agreement with the city on how they would be developed. And at that time, some developers were able to get exemptions for putting in sidewalk, where others mm -hmm. just did it. And I think uh, going back even further, there may have been just, it wasn't part of the city code. And so sometimes they did it and sometimes they didn't. But in more recent times, and by that, I mean, since the fifties, I think it was more like a developer would get an exemption on a whole, for whatever reason, they'd say, oh, you know, um, I'm doing this, sidewalks aren't going to be needed. Do I really also need to do that in addition to whatever I'm doing? There are some areas where they would dedicate, as part of the development, they would dedicate space for parks in addition to having um, plats of you know subdivided lots. So um, I think there were negotiations that happened. None of it was written down, it's all like hearsay, but that's how it happened. Um, unfortunately, it did create a situation like you're describing where, although technically that area of the parkway is still owned by the city, people have taken it to be their own private property and frequently have put up, not frequently, in many cases, they've put up obstructions. 
that don't allow people to walk in their yard. And they get really upset if people are walking where they perceive it to be their yard. And even when it's wide open and the people whose house it is don't care if school children walk in the yard and the grass, um, as soon as it snows and we plow the street, uh, that becomes sort of a non-option because there's a big hill of snow there. And so people then just walk in the street anyway. And one of the issues that we have with having a an incomplete network like this is that it is often when the weather is very bad that people are most likely to walk in the street. And those people are usually children on the way to school. So it's really um, not great situation. Generally, um, the other part about not having a complete sidewalk network is that when we talk about the use of mass transit like buses, the first part of your journey and the last part of your journey are usually walking because it doesn't drop you off at your house, it drops you off at a stop and you have to get to where you're going. And so having a, a, a sidewalk network with gaps actually does not support the use of mass transit. So for that reason, um, you know, we, have worked with council to come up with a program where we start filling this in, but honestly, it's a long-term program. I mean, we are 10 or 20 years from having a complete sidewalk network, even with fairly generous funding. So it's um, that is why we are proposing to use CDBG funds and TIF funds to try to supplement um, the situation. We feel like it's really important for CARP and expanding pedestrian and mass transit use. And it's really important for equity because the people that are most impacted tend to be vulnerable populations or people of lower income that don't have access to their own motorized vehicle. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Council Member Reed, you have a, a question? No, no, well, uh, actually, well, two things, yeah. Um, one, uh, if we're starting to wrap down the sidewalk discussion as well, um, then I just wanna thank Laura and her team. Um, but I, I did on sidewalks, I just wanted to note for Hugo, uh, Hugo in the eighth ward, um, th just to highlight how possessive some folks get of the, uh, I thought, you know what, before I started my campaign, I was walking around the neighborhood and uh, was, was speaking to some folks, and I noticed, oh, well, here are the streets in the eighth ward that don't have sidewalks. And I thought, you know, that's something I could talk to neighbors about and, uh, you know, be an issue campaign about helping them get sidewalks. And I was walking past a, a few folks who were out in their yards where they didn't have sidewalks and didn't say who I was. And I just engaged with them and asked them about the lack of a sidewalk. And they said they loved that they didn't have sidewalks. Mm -hmm. And I was so surprised to hear that. And I just, why? Well, that I'll drop that issue and won't, uh, you know, go disrupting people. And so, yeah, there are some people who are extremely possessive about it, but I think as Laura highlighted, we really just need to educate folks um, about the, the equity and climate concerns here. And I think we can uh, change a lot of minds and we don't really need to change minds because it's our property already. We hope to do it in a friendly way though. Yeah. But there's no doubt there's probably gonna be those holdouts that are unhappy with the progress. and. I think we just have to try to work with people as best we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so there's surveys show them where their land is, for sure. Sure, yeah. And that that's actually a problem by itself. Many people do not realize when they buy the house that their property ends hmm. ten feet from the curb. The like it, they just don't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, committee, any further comments or questions about the infrastructure projects? Or I think maybe we're ready to vote on our motion, which was to approve the 2023 CDBG funding for City of Evanston programs and projects based on the estimated 2023 CDBG grant amounts as listed in the packets. So. I don't comment is thank you, Laura and yeah. team. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Thank you. Okay, and now we're ready for a roll call on our vote on our motion. Chair Ravel. Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. 
Council Member Burns. Aye. Kathy Fangold. Aye. Hugo Rodriguez. Aye. Joanne Salome. Aye. And Lauren Berlin. Aye. Motion passes. Great. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Um, now uh, we need a motion to recommend approval of the draft 2023 action plan uh, recommended to City Council. Um, I guess we're recommending Council approve it following receipt of the 2023 entitlement grant amounts. So moved. Okay, and a second, please. Second. Okay, so we had the plan in many, many pages of the plan in our packet. Um, <laughs> anybody has a any comments or questions about that? Which I'm sure you all read diligently. <laughs> I, I just want to add a comment before there's any question for anybody that's um, worried. Maybe they didn't grasp all 180 pages of the plan. Um, we pull out the allocation plan, which is the big part of this document, specifically right. to make sure that that part is discussed. Um, and that, that's a big part of, of what you're approving here. Right, exactly. Yeah. No, we, we've had a really good and thorough discussion, I think, about, about that. Um, okay, then I guess we're ready for... Uh, sure, I just did have one quick question. Oh, for, okay. um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for Marion. Um, you, you mentioned something earlier, and I, I can't remember exactly what it says, but it was, it, it seemed like there might be um, funding, um, kind of left, uh, uh, left over funding, remaining funding at some point that we might be able to allocate for some other purpose. I, I missed all of it. I caught like a little bit of it, and I don't, I don't know if uh, you remember. Uh, what, there's a couple of things I, I had mentioned. Remember. So on the, um, and I'm sorry, I'm um, having trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the housing rehab, we were mentioning we weren't allocating as much because um, there was some unexpended from previous years. So this year we didn't uh, feel we needed to um, allocate as much as previous years because we want to make sure we were uh, mindful of the bandwidth and what's actually possible to be spent. Um, and then I had talked about how the um, funding is now like the allocation plan is by percentage uh, and should and it's based on estimate grants. So should there be a higher amount uh, that's actually a final grant amount, then there could be some, a little bit of additional funding because we are being usually a little bit conservative. Uh, and should there be any major changes in what the committee wants to do with um, allocation, there's always a certain percentage of changes we can make because we're working by percentage and because there's a kind of 20% kind of threshold at which uh, for reallocation by go, at which point we need to have a substantial amendment. So there's a few areas where there's flexibility. Should there be any change between now and the moment where we um, go to city council with the final grants to get the plan, the, the action plan approved. And and so I've talked to, you to I've sent an email um, to you and I think Sarah offline about this, but and I don't know if this is uh, uh, relevant to this discussion. Um, so excuse me if it's not. But uh, you know we I talked about a, um, a, a a potential park improvement project in the CDBG area. Uh, we have um, you know one of our we, we talked a lot about um, the uh, the amount of the, the fact that we're behind in improving uh, our some of our parks, in particular our play equipment at, at parks, and we have one in the CDBG area in Twigs Park that I know is eligible for some funds. I don't know if it's which bucket it is. Um, and so I guess my question is, would that be, would that require, if we did have additional funds, um, could we allocate it? Obviously, this would be after a discussion towards that type of project without a major kind of amendment. Um, Yes, I would got that, a couple. Would that fall under livable communities as an example or? Yes, it would. So um, okay. I have a couple of things. I did bring up um, your suggestion to uh, Larry Biggs and I, I wish um, she was still on the call, um, but she did uh, She did get this, this information. She shared with us that um, at this point, she would like to look at the project altogether within both the parks um, play equipment improvement effort that she has with her entire team, as well as just the a potential kind of 
larger look at what the parks need as far as uh, renovation or uh, improvements. Um, so that could be coming, that could be a discussion maybe for a, sl a slightly larger scope, um, especially with a skate park that may be coming in. And then uh, should there be additional funding um, that comes as an example, additional to the estimated grant that we projected, uh, yes, there could that additional funding could be put towards the livable community within that 20% range. So as an example, 20% of 680 would be about 130, if I'm 135, 140. So within that range, that could be potentially allocated to that goal. Um, and we wouldn't have to make major changes um, and have a substantial amendment to the action plan. So that is a possibility. Uh, but I believe that probably would be good to have this effort be part of a larger look at what's um, needed in that park and in parks in general. Um, I, I agree with, uh, and I'll talk to you more about this line, about this park. I think including all parks outside of the CDBG area kind of takes it out of the scope of, of this committee. Um, but definitely uh, I wanted to include it as part of a larger discussion about Twigs Park. Um, but I'll, we can discuss that more offline, but thank you for that. Yeah. <clears throat> Any, any other comments or questions? Okay, uh, then I think we're ready for a roll call on the motion to recommend approval of the draft 2023 action plan to city council. Chair Ravel. Aye. Council member Reed. Aye. Council member Burns. Aye. Kathy Fangold. Aye. Hugo Rodriguez? Aye. Joanne Salome? Aye. And Lauren Berling? Aye. Motion passes. Great, thank you very much. And then uh, we have one last motion, which uh, we need a motion to approve our 2023 uh, Housing and Community Development Committee meeting dates that were in the packet. Yes, um, the calendar is still for every, um, third Tuesday of the month, mm -hmm. um, with the exception of December, which mm -hmm. we moved to December 12th, mm -hmm. right. um, much like this year, but we wanted to be preemptive and get it done so everybody knows um, before time and, ha and plans accordingly. Um, mm -hmm. So these are the dates, and we are still um, thinking of having it at 7 p.m., if that works for everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, could we have the motion? Yeah, Council Member Reed? Uh, I'll move the uh, meeting calendar. Uh, I will note that, uh, so I, I have, I'm on the Finance and Budget Committee and that committee meets on the second Tuesday of every month, which is fine. It's just today, and I'll assume this will happen again next year, mm -hmm. we had back-to-back -back meetings and that caused me to be a bit late here. Mm -hmm. And so, Again, we don't have to change the committee schedule for me, but um, mm -hmm. is the first Tuesday in December, uh, a, is there a reason we couldn't do that date? That would be very challenging because we would really have to move okay. the whole development of the draft action plan back. I'm sorry, okay. it's a okay. real pain. No, 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 no. <laughs> what no, no, what time, okay. Council Member Reed, what time does your other meeting end? Uh, we ended today uh just i'd uh, say maybe six or i mean uh 7 30 whatever time a little bit after this committee started i jumped off before the end of it uh to get here so if if we bumped it just to 7 30 i mean would you be able to do back to back i'm sure it makes for a long no time. i'm fine doing that i'm i'm used well, to council marathon meetings so i'm fine with that okay um, i certainly could do 7 30 7 30 is kind of late for other folks i don't want to push the committee back just, but I know council member Burns is also on finance and budget right. uh, as well. Yeah. I mean, I think that it, you're both valuable. I mean, people could email if they don't want to speak in front of the whole group, but I, I could do 7.30 start, you know, or 7.15, we could split the difference, you know? Yeah, maybe 7.15. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a huge deal. Are, are we saying for just that meeting or? Yeah. Just okay. for that meeting. Yeah, yeah. that's just, fine. Just, yeah. yeah, okay. All right. So so we've had the we've had a motion. I need a second. Second. And then, but we're amending it to say that the December meeting 
would start at 715. Correct. Okay. All right, we're ready to go. Okay. Chair Ravel. Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. Council Member Burns. Aye. Kathy Feingold. Aye. Hugo Rodriguez. Aye. Joanne Salome. Aye. And Lauren Berlin. Aye. All right, motion passes. Great, okay, thank you. Yes, um, American. Yes, I just wanted to provide, uh, before we adjourn the meeting, I just wanted to provide a couple staff updates um, okay. that um, you're, you may want to hear about. Um, I wanted to mention that the One Stop Shop um, advisory group had their first meeting last week, um, and it went quite well. Um, so they are starting the conversation. They had their introduction, uh, got um, some of the group members to meet um, and start having some conversation. Some helpful conversation and uh, they will work, they would meet probably every month for the next three to four months and then they have some um, additional conversation after that. And they're also um, starting to think about potential focus groups with landlords and um, tenants, no, sorry, not tenants, homeowners and residents um, to make sure they have, um, they can hear from the community. Uh, and then the second uh, and third item I wanted to mention so that you're aware, uh, in January, we are hoping um, to be able to kickstart the conversation around the landlord tenant ordinance um, review. Uh, so what we're hoping to do is to provide you with some background information and some um, overview of the work that had already been started uh, back in 2021, so that we can start in February with some um, further conversation about how to bring in um, the multiple regulations and conversation that have been going on throughout the city on this topic, including um, just cause eviction, just housing, and other uh, Cook County and Chicago uh, landlord tenant ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, and as well, we're hoping, although that may be a little bit of ambition of uh, ambitious of a schedule for January, we're hoping to maybe be able to um, provide you with an update on our uh, inclusionary housing ordinance review um, and provide some high level uh, suggestion um, to get some feedback before we come back um, to this group with a little bit more of um, a proposal for an update to the IHO, um, ideally in February if schedule allows. Okay, busy. Sarah. The, our lovely federal government um, has not, of course, done its appropriations um, bills, in, <laughs> but they have a continuing resolution until this Friday. There is discussion that they're going to try to pass a year-long continuing resolution um, and just basically um, have the same budget levels as this year with uh, 2022 with very few changes. Um, whether that will happen is not certain, um, but if it does not happen, we could have some real delays because we will be getting a changeover with the Republicans taking control of the House. So, you know, the Democrats are trying to, <laughs> well, you know, it's the same old thing, right? Um, trying to figure out how to move that forward. Um, but I just wanted to make you aware of that. So if they were to... Um, pass a continuing resolution for the entire year through, you know, on the 16th, and that would go, you know, obviously for the remainder of the fiscal year to of September 30th. Um, what would happen is HUD would have its 60 days to look at its formulas and rejigger them. And that would be one of the soonest time, you know, quickest, uh, the federal government has passed a budget in a very long time. Uh, that does not necessarily guarantee that the whole grant, even I mean, we, we would be able to start working on our action plan sooner than we have some years, but that doesn't necessarily mean um, we would get access to our funds a whole lot sooner. HUD gets backed up just as we all do because they have other things planned out through their year. So when the federal government does appropriations, it kind of can screw up their schedules as well. But I just wanted to make you aware that we're still waiting for a budget, obviously, and mm -hmm. we'll let you know when we hear anything. Right. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, Council Member Reed. Yeah, I just wanted to ask staff to give, uh, it's come up in public comment a number of times at council, give a quick update on where we are with the small landlord uh, funding. Sure, actually that was why I was raising my hand because I realized that was the fourth item I wanted to update this committee on um, that I missed. Um, so we were hoping to have the small landlord uh, proposal that you uh, voted on uh, last at last committee. Um, we were hoping that it would get to city council on uh, Monday's city council, uh, but that was pushed to January because there's been uh, multiple requests for ARPA funding and there was a need to coordinate um, all of those requests um, mm -hmm. and make sure they were push through um, at the same time for coordination. Um, so at this point, we're hoping that this is going to go to city council on January 9th. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. I, I would also like to note that we have a hand raised by um, an attendant now. Oh, um, Tina okay. Payton is here. And I think we, I, yeah. I would guess Tina would like to make comment. Okay. All uh, right, and since we moved the public comment, uh, but it was original on the agenda at the end, I'm going to move Tina to uh, allow her to provide public comment. Tina, okay. you should be able Hi. to speak. Hi, good evening. Hi. Uh, Hi. Yes, I was very upset that that did not go to council yesterday since you all voted and said that it would go to the 12th. Mm -hmm. um, it's very unfortunate that... Um, other businesses are getting half a million dollars and millions of dollars. And what you all say so important, affordable housing. And here I am waiting still another month. And from what you passed anyway, I do not qualify because you lowered it to 25 and I have 27 units. So it doesn't matter anyway. So the city has continuously cut me out for many years and I'll just have to cut out my affordable units because I can't afford it. And it's very sad that businesses right here by my place, 650,000 for soul and smoke and someone to hold a waiting list from SEPA, 50,000 to hold a waiting list. Well, I have many people calling me from connections and other agencies looking for apartments. I cannot afford to do this and no help from the city. It's a slap in the face and just get pushed down the line with many promises unfulfilled. And I would also like to say that if you do not include the landlord in all of these new uh, ordinances that you plan on passing in January, it is gonna be a bad situation for you all for continuing for, to get people to provide affordable housing. Uh, you exclude the landlord in financials and you also exclude the landlord in making any ordinance and negotiations. And that is why you cannot find people to take the programs. So I hope you think about this on moving forward in your decisions. Thank you and happy holidays. Thank you, Tina. Thank you. Okay. So is that, that's the last from staff? Great, okay. Well then Thanks. I- I think uh, we have concluded our business and our next meeting is January 17th. So uh, with that, um, happy holidays to everybody and we are adjourned. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thanks. Happy holidays. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well. Happy holidays. Mm -hmm. Thank you. See you next year. Oh my gosh. Bye-bye. <laughs>